if you grew up in the church, chances are that at some point you were told to pray through the book of the Psalms, otherwise known as the Psalter. But what do you do when you come to a Psalm like Psalm 137? How are we to understand and utilize psalms that invoke curses upon others? How are we to understand and utilize that rejoices in the smashing of baby heads against rocks? I think there are various ways to answer this question, but today I want to answer this question through the lens of something called speech act theory. Now, if you know me for some time, you know that I love languages, and I love trying to understand how languages work. And so this is one of my favorite theories out there. So speech act theory has its roots in the philosophy of language. That is the branch of philosophy that is interested in how language works. And in its simplest form, speech act theory is the idea that we do things with our words. Or to put it another way, we perform actions with our words. For example, we can command with our words. So I might say to my children, go, clean your room. I've used my words to command. I performed an action. We can insult with our words. So if I say to someone, man, you're so dumb. I've used my words to insult someone, right? I performed the action of insulting. We can compliment people with our words. Hey, you did a great job today. We can make requests with our words. Could you please pass the broccoli? And so on, right? But it's not just us who uh, does things with words. God also does things with words, right? We see in Genesis 1 that God creates with his words. And we as Christians say that God changes us with his words. We say that God instructs us with our words. God does things with words. And we pray that he would do exactly that today. All of this means, though, that our words have power and that words are powerful. It also means that God's word is powerful to instruct and change us. As we pray, he does so today. In today's sermon... I want for us to see Psalm 137 as performing three speech acts. So first, imprecatory psalms as lament. Second, imprecatory psalms as anger. And third, imprecatory psalms as hope and trust. Or to put it another way, I want to show you that the psalmist of 137 are doing three things with their words. They're performing three actions. They are lamenting. They are expressing anger, and they are hoping and trusting. I should briefly mention that we don't actually have any psalms in the Psalter that are entirely imprecatory. Imprecations are usually accompanied by lament, and this makes sense as imprecations, or when we express anger or invoke curses upon others, it's, also, it's often followed by events or it's followed um, by events that causes pain and sorrow. And so this leads us to our first point, imprecatory psalms as lament. So let me read the first four verses for us again. Beside the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept as we thought of Jerusalem. We put away our harps, hanging them on the branches of poplar trees. For our captors demanded a song from us. Our tormentors insisted on a joyful hymn. Sing us one of those songs of Jerusalem. But how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a pagan land? In the first four verses, the psalmist provides the context for our psalm. The psalmist is by the rivers of Babylon, weeping as they thought of Jerusalem. You see, in 587 BCE, the Babylonians enter into Jerusalem, destroy the temple, which houses God and is their central site of worship, and proceeds to take many of the Israelites into exile, of whom our psalm is, 
of whom our psalmist is one. Now, as those who dwell in a foreign land, they are oppressed and tormented as their captors demand that they sing songs of Zion or Jerusalem. Their demands were inappropriate for two reasons. First, Psalms of Zion declare the sovereignty of God over all things. But imagine telling a people who just lost everything and were forced to migrate to a different land to sing about the sovereignty of their God. This is mockery. And I think many of us here can resonate to some extent with Psalm 137 as we know what it's like to be mocked. I shared before that growing up, I was ashamed of my Korean heritage. And in one sense, how could I not be when throughout grade school, people mocked the Asians for how their language sounded? I remember growing up that people would ask me how to say a certain word in Korean, and then they would proceed to purposely say it in a mocking manner. And we're, remi- we're reminded that things like this still happen today as the chancellor of Purdue University Northwest has recently mocked Asian people and their language. Indeed, for many of us, we know what it's like to be mocked. Second, songs of Zion mark joyous occasions. And it again, it declares God's kingship over all things. In essence, the Babylonians demanded joy from a people for whom joy was not possible. So rather than sing, the Israelites hang up their harps. They refused to sing joyful songs. Instead, they chose to lament. As one scholar puts it, for the community in forced migration, beauty was lament. I want to pause here and offer some pastoral advice because I think we too have the tendency to demand joy from others when they are not in a situation to be joyful, when it might be impossible for them to be joyful. As Joseph reminded us last week, Western Christianity tends to emphasize triumph, victory, and joy to the detriment or neglect of lament, confusion, and sorrow. Thus, at times, we take one verse, like rejoice always in the Lord, and we impose it upon others while neglecting the very next line that tells us to mourn with those who mourn. We, too, can sometimes demand that others rejoice too quickly. We don't give them time to process their pain and their hurts. We don't take time to listen, and we make sure to correct their bad theology in moments of suffering. Surely, sometimes we are too quick to speak and too slow to listen. And let me say that I too am guilty of this. Brothers and sisters, the next time someone is expressing their sorrows with you, I encourage you to simply listen, let them grieve, and grieve alongside them. Sometimes just being with those who are lamenting and simply listening is pastoral. After all, we're reminded that Jesus too wept when he learned that Lazarus had died. He wept alongside Mary. So when Mary approaches Jesus and she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus doesn't correct her. He doesn't say you have bad theology. Rather, he weeps with her. Brothers and sisters, we ought to do likewise. For those of you who are in a difficult time but feel as though you must cut your lament short, Psalm 137 not only validates your lament, but provides the language and emotions necessary for uh, for you to continue to lament. Grieve as long as you need to, and we, as a church, will be there for you. Sometimes, though, grieving and lamenting is not the final stop of our emotional journey. 
Sometimes lament turns into anger. And that is indeed what happens in Psalm 137, which leads us to our next point. Imprecatory Psalms as anger. So let me read verses 7 to 9 for us, and then we'll come back in the third point and read verses 5 to 9 again. So verse 7. O Lord, remember what the Edomites did on the day the armies of ba Babylon captured Jerusalem. Destroy it, they yelled. Level it to the ground. O Babylon, you will be destroyed. Happy is the one who pays you back for what you have done to us. Happy is the one who takes your babies and smashes them against rocks. So here are the Israelites in exile in Babylon. And as they think about what has just happened, they are angered. They remember the Edomites who helped the Babylonians attack and destroy the temple in Jerusalem. And it even gets quite graphic. It seems as though the Edomites and the Babylonians were somehow involved in the smashing of the Israelites' babies' heads against rocks. What has happened to them is inhumane, and they are rightfully angered. And their anger is expressed in the words that we just read. They're doing things with their words, right? They're expressing their anger. So the Israelites exclaim, destroy Babylon, level it to the ground, and happy is the one who takes their babies and smashes them against rocks. In one sense, the Israelites cry to dash babies against rocks is horrifying, right? And yet, I think the important thing to notice here is that God doesn't step in to correct them. God receives their anger and gives them space to be angry and sometimes even use horrifying language if we feel as we must instead of suppressing them. How do we notice? How do we know that God permits and even invites us to express our anger with him or to him? We know because we find them in our very scriptures. The fact that Psalm 137 is in our Bible means that God has affirmed the words of Psalm 137, right? God doesn't look at Psalm 137 and says, hey, we should take it out of our Bibles. And let me say that some communities do, right? The language is so horrifying that some communities don't think that we should pray through Psalm 137. And yet, again, the fact that we find it in our very scriptures suggests that God affirms the words of Psalm 137. Psalm 137 then gives voice to those who are angry and again provides the language necessary to express our anger. As one commentator puts it, when we are deeply harmed and our anger boils, it would be both fruitless because God reads our heart and dangerous to suppress these emotions rather than turning them over to God. Before going any further, though, let me say that this psalm does not validate all anger. In some, or even many cases, anger is simple. If every little thing ticks you off and leads you to respond with anger, yelling and so forth, your response is probably simple. The psalm does not give you the liberty to be upset and angry about every little thing. Rather, this psalm gives you the freedom to be angry when it is appropriate. So, this psalm doesn't give me the right to get angry when my wife decides to put cardboard into the recycling bin where only cans and bottles go because she's in a rush. It doesn't give me the right to be upset because on Sunday night, I have to separate the cardboard from the cans and bottles when I take out the trash. Rather, it gives us the right to be angry in the face of injustices, whether it's inflicted upon someone else or when we feel as though we have been unjustly treated. On the other hand, can I say 
that some Christians don't get angry enough. For many of us, we were taught growing up that all anger is wrong and Christians shouldn't be angry. Yet with all of the injustices in America and around the world, how can we not get angry? To be frank, the teaching that encourages Christians to never get angry, I think, is a form of control. It tells us that we ought not to speak out against the injustices we see in this world. Psalm 137 then, in the words of one scholar, confronts an apathetic and ambivalent people and invites them to hate, incites them to side with Yahweh, his son, and his people. After all, Jesus gets angry at the injustices surround, surrounding the temple, right? He flips the table, he drives out money changers, and the Gospel of John, he even has a whip. When we stand against what is wrong in the world, we align ourselves with Jesus and become more like him. Some situations demand that we get angry. In fact, if you are not angry about some of the things that are happening in the world, I would question your love for people, your concern for others. God not only invites our anger, but affirms it when it is necessary and appropriate. In fact, anger can be a form of hope and trust, which leads us to our third and final point. In precatory psalms as hope, and trust. So let me read again for us verses 5 through 9 and sense the hope and trust in these verses. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget how to play the harp. May my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I fail to remember you, if I don't make Jerusalem my greatest joy. O Lord, remember what the Edomites did on the day that the armies of Babylon captured Jerusalem. Destroy it, they yelled. Level it to the ground. O Babylon, you will be destroyed. Happy is the one who pays you back for what you have done to us. Happy is the one who takes your baby and smashes him against rocks. Despite the tendency to view anger as antithetical to hope and or trust, I want for us to see that anger itself can be a form of hope and trust. Again, not all anger is a form of hope and trust. But in some situations, anger can be a form of act or an act of hope and trust. So in Psalm 137, we see a psalmist who is longing to return back to Jerusalem. We see a psalmist, even in his anger and lament, asking God to remember what has been done to them. The psalmist here is bringing his emotions and his pains to God and asking God to do something about it. The psalmist has not given up on God. If you have given up on God, you don't bring your anger to God. So he says in verses 8 to 9, again, blessed is the one who pays you back for what you have done. Blessed is the one who takes your babies and smashes them against rocks. I want to note briefly here that the word for happy can also be translated blessed, and it's the more common translation. Again, it's one of the few places in the NLT from which I'm reading from that I, I disagree with the translation, right? I think the more common translation of blessed is the better translation. But the more important question here is who is the blessed one? Who is the blessed one that pays back and carries out justice? The one that they're looking to, to get revenge for them, right? Who is this blessed one? Surely, as we think about who this blessed one is, they're not looking forward to a human agent. Rather, the blessed one who accomplishes justice is God himself. So what is the psalmist doing with his words that are marked by lament and anger? He is ultimately trusting and hoping that God will do something. 
It's important to note that the psalmist doesn't seek to carry out revenge or justice as he sees fit. He doesn't attempt to carry it out himself. Rather, he entrusts vengeance to God, regardless of what it may look like. In this way, we see Paul's command to never take revenge and to leave revenge to the righteous anger of God playing out here. As one commentator notes, the imprecations are not just expressions of anger. They allow us to turn our anger over to God for him to act as he sees fit. These prayers do not ask God for the resources and opportunity to take vengeance on our enemies. They ask God to do so and acknowledge his freedom to act or not act as he sees fit. Anger then, like all other emotions that God has given us, is a legitimate response to life in a fallen world. Can we all be honest for a second? Sometimes life sucks. Sometimes life hurts. In these moments, it's okay to be angry. But brothers and sisters, in such times, don't just be angry. Be sure to bring it to God, or else you're just being angry. There's no hope or trust in your anger. And let me be the first to say that this is hard. I don't know about you, but when I get angry, I more often than not, Don't bring my anger to God. Instead, I sit there and stew in my anger. Right? It's completely unproductive. A lot of times, there is no hope or trust in my anger. The act of bringing our anger to God must be learned and practiced because it's hard to turn to God in our prayers. We must learn how to bring our anger to God, instead of just letting it stew. In a way then, God teaches us how to be angry through Psalm 137, in a way that hopes and trusts in God. God invites us to bring our pains and our hurts to Him, and ultimately teaches us to hope and trust in Him by pointing us to Christ. As the story of the Bible unfolds, who the blessed one of verses 8 to 9 becomes clear. The blessed one of these verses is Jesus. Jesus is the true and better blessed one of Psalm 137, who will enact God's judgment and justice when he returns in whatever way he sees fit and will take us home to a heavenly Jerusalem where peace and justice abound. He will bring an end to our lament and our anger. It is in Jesus, the blessed one of Psalm 137, to whom we give and surrender our anger. We bring it to him with hope, trusting that he hears us and that he will do something about it, whether now or in the future. And we trust that he will do something about it now or in the future because he came to earth. He became like humanity. He died for our sins. He resurrected, as he said. He ascended to heaven and is seating at the right hand of God, interceding for us as one who can deal empathetically with us. He can receive our anger. He can deal with our anger. He understands our hardships, in our struggles, our lament and anger. It is to this Jesus that we give and surrender our anger, and we trust that he will do something about it, whether in this lifetime or in the one to come. In the end, regardless of how and when Jesus decides to carry out God's judgment and justice, there's one thing we know for sure, that Jesus is a good and just God, and we can trust him to do all things well, and that we ought to bring our anger to him as a form of trust and hope. Let us pray.
Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that in your word, we see just an array of emotions. And these emotions correspond to just the difficulties of life, the hardships of life in a fallen world. Lord, we thank you that in your word, we find anger has a response. I know for many of us, when things get hard, we do get angry. And in the cases in which we get angry and it's inappropriate, we pray that you forgive us. But in times where, where anger is appropriate, we thank you that your word validates our anger. Lord, we thank you that we have one to whom we can give our anger and hope and trust that all things will be done right. Lord, we're thankful for your word and the gospel. We love you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.